Hello, listeners. Been wondering how you can help the show? Probably not. But here are five things you can do. One, subscribe. Support the show by clicking the subscription link in the show notes. Two, review on iTunes, on our website, www.afraidofnothingpodcast.com, or on whatever app you listen to. Three, donate. When you go to our website, click the cute coffee cup icon. Or in the show notes, click the subscription link. Four, share. Sharing really is caring. Tell your friends and even your enemies to check out the show. Five, watch. Wait a minute. It's a podcast, not a movie. Actually, it's both. Check the show notes to find out where to watch the documentary. You can also rent it on Prime Video. That's it. Oh, one last thing. Enjoy this episode. Hey, everybody, it's Bob Heskey, and on today, our 20th episode, we kind of have a first. We have Laura Marini, who is a producer of several paranormal programs on the Travel Channel. And we're going to be talking to Laura soon. But first, I wanted to tell you about two contests, which I'd love for you to participate in. One is for Amazon Prime. If you go on Amazon Prime and watch Afraid of Nothing and leave a review, send me a copy of your review at bobhesky at gmail.com, B-O-B-H-E-S-K-E at gmail.com. And I will pick at the end of each month a winner of the best review picked randomly. And if you live in North America, I will send you a Afraid of Nothing t-shirt. Just give me your size and I'll send you an Afraid of Nothing t-shirt. Also, for the podcast listeners, which I'm sure those of you listening now, if you please send me an MP3, a no longer than 30 seconds, a quick review of either this podcast as a whole or a favorite episode, what you liked about it, I will air one or two of those at the beginning of shows upcoming and also at the end of each month i will randomly pick a winner and i will be able to ship a t-shirt to someone who lives in north america uh, afraid of nothing t-shirt so if you're overseas please still do leave reviews on amazon prime and for send me an mp3 for the podcast if you know somebody in the u.s i can send them a t-shirt on your behalf so thank you very much and on with the show In a world where nothing is known, nothing is certain, reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host? This is my podcast, based on my paranormal documentary, Afraid of Nothing. Each episode, we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens. Join me. Who is this large man? And what's he doing in our bedroom? As we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie. This is Afraid of Nothing. Hello, Laura Marini. Uh, we have actually, we met at the Mass Paracon, God, it's been like nine months ago, and I had told you about the podcast there, I think, and it's taken this long to get you on the show, but you are episode 20, Laura. Wow. Do I win anything? A year's supply of turtle wax? Yeah, I'll get you another copy of the uh, the DVD for Afraid of Nothing. <laughs> which was very good. So yeah, she you. bought it. And she just watched it, folks, before she was on here, which is great. And that's a compliment from you because you are a producer. I've had a bunch of people on the show. You're the first producer of the paranormal that uh, ah. I've had on or that our listeners get to listen to. And you bring kind of a different perspective. And you've worked on a lot of shows that people may be familiar with. 
the most famous ones I'll throw out are The Haunting of, which is basically a one-hour shows about uh, celebrities with haunted houses. And we'll talk about that mm-hmm. a little bit. And then also Most Terrifying Places. Uh, one of my favorite places was on there, which was the SK Pierce House in Gardner. Yes, very haunted. Then a very popular show right now, Destination Fear. So we, we can't go into specifics on the shows, but let's just talk about as a producer, what your job is. Sure. You know, I've made a couple movies myself, and I think producer is one of the hardest jobs around because you have to be, you have to plan things and you have to react when things go wrong. So can you kind of talk about the different types of roles that a producer does uh, for for TV shows? Sure. And I think they're similar Definitely when it comes to the paranormal or when it, whether it comes to true crime or whether it comes to history. In, in many cases, the producer is the person who comes up with the idea for that episode. Um, like the show has already been greenlit by the network and someone had came up with that. But episodically, uh, producers often have input on what that topic is or what the location is. Like for some of the shows that we do that are paranormal, we have to find these locations and talk to the owners, find out they'll allow us to shoot there, um, what kind of permits we need, whatever. But also we are looking for people with real stories. So you have to be able to connect with folks really quickly and really kind of suss out if they have a story that's uh, credible, if they can tell it well, if they're going to be okay on camera, they're going to be able to tell their own story, to be able to bring out the story of people Often on true crime shows, um, you know, folks, this is the worst uh, time of their life and they have to relive it. And you want to be sympathetic, but you also, having done this enough times and having to listen to your own voice interviewing them later when you go and listen to it or watch it and try to pick the pieces that are going to end up in the show, you have to know what you need and what people at home will need in order to understand the story. So it's it's a lot of things. It's it's logistics. It's hand holding. It's thinking six steps ahead, like you just said, because you've done this too. You have to have contingency plans. I always say that you have to be. You have to have all your logistics and everything locked down so that you can then be spontaneous. So the there shouldn't be any surprises on your end. Yeah. I got to tell you, when I made a, uh, I made a drama, so I, I made two films. One was a drama called Blessed, uh, which one of our mutual friends, Rob Fitz, was the, from Salem. He, he runs the Magic Parlor. He was the director of that. I hired him, and he helped me get a lot of the crew because he knows a lot of people locally. Oh, I love Rob Fitz. Rob and the crew were great, but I was just a nervous wreck because it was my first film. So I, I was so stressful as a producer. I mean, I think I did a good job, but when, it was, when I didn't enjoy the journey because I was so worried about everything and things kept happening. Mm-hmm. When I made a documentary, Afraid of Nothing, that was a little more measured. I could do it on weekends and spread it out. But I found the producer role very challenging, at yes. least for my personality. Mm-hmm. Is it common for a person to be a producer on many multiple episodes of a show? Oh, yeah. Um, How it works in, I guess, in the national TV shows or whatever, is you usually have about three or four, depending on how many episodes you've been greenlit for. Like, say there's three producers for the season, um, usually take on like three episodes and you're in charge of that episode. But if if it's something like segmented, like Mysteries at the Museum or Most Terrifying, those you actually have segment producers who are finding locations who are, who just it's like they have to be able to produce like these little seven minute pieces that stand alone. So there's a difference between someone who can produce for an hour or two hours. Like I did a two hour documentary on the uh, captains of Star Trek back in 2010, which was a labor of love. But it's you know it's like you have to be able to pull a story arc through ten segments or 10 acts. Uh, whereas um, some of these other ones are more like a short, like telling short stories. But then again, you have to be more elegant sometimes when you're telling a short story because you only have seven minutes to tell it rather than two hours or for an hour in TV is like 42 minutes and 10 seconds or something without the commercials. Yeah. So that's like, they're almost like anthologies. And I wonder if that's even more challenging because mm-hmm. any anthology you watch, some are horrible, <laughs> some segments and some are are good. And you're really, it's on you to make sure that all of them are good, correct? Well, when I was, uh, when I do supervising producer, yes, you're kind of the overarching person, but you always try, like, we try to find producers who can adapt a style that is similar so that you, when you're watching it, you can't tell, oh, a different person produced that, a different person produced that. You want the styles to be 
enough the same so that there's a look to the show. Like you don't want to find someone who is, you know, their ego is too big and they're like, oh, I'm going to make, you know, put my own stamp on it. You want people who can bring your vision to life. You want people who can say, oh, this is what that show looks like and and I'm going to adapt to that style. I mean, of course, you want to be creative and bring all your, you know, all your A game to it, but you don't want to uh, make it look like someone could look at it and go, that does that doesn't look like the rest of the show. Yeah, that's a that's a lot of. Resp- I'm, I'm saying it again, but I mean, it's a lot of responsibility. And I know if I was doing a crew again, one of the main people I look for right away is is a producer because mm-hmm. there's a lot of trust in that person to get it. Yeah. Right. How did you start in this? Did you go to school for oh. like at Emerson, or, did, or how did you start in this thing? Uh, let's see. Uh, my undergrads in TV, of course. Well, not of course, but I guess in this case, everyone has different roots. Yeah. Like I have a cousin who was an actor first and then he became a, a producer and he's very good uh, But because he knew what it was like in front of the camera. I guess I always used to be like a stage manager for plays and all that kind of stuff. And I was a DJ on uh, radio and actually was the general manager of radio stations. I think it's a similar kind of thing as a producer to, from being like a stage manager and a general manager or whatever. A lot of producers' work is management as well as creative. So you kind of have to do both. So you have to kind of, I guess, be neurotic about details. And I mean, I was a a military brat, so you know to lock down everything. You know know that you need to have X, Y, and Z. You better have that ready. You better have backup. That you always have contingencies. You're always three steps ahead in case something is awry. And when it comes to the paranormal, there's always, I mean, and the more paranormal I do, the more I know that you've got to be ready for contingencies because things happen. Think, I mean, you go there, you've got all your batteries, they're fresh, everybody's got fresh batteries in, and then the audio goes out. You had that happen on, on uh, Afraid of Nothing, yeah. yeah. We used to have that all the time on The Haunting of, I mean, Kim would be talking to a celebrity like Meatloaf. And then when the lights go out, we're all standing in the dark for 10 minutes. Um, you know, the batteries, somebody's lavalier is all wonky, even though they brand new one, nothing was wrong with it three minutes ago. Yeah. And, and it just sucks your batteries out, even though um, it might be really warm outside, inside the house is cold for some bizarre reason. And yeah, all sorts of weird stuff happens. <laughs> Yeah, so you you also have had stuff happen outside in your personal life. I mean, you live in New York now, correct? Yeah, uh, yes. In the in the epic center of the pandemic, did you come from Massachusetts, the Salem area? Is that where, where were you kind of weaned on the paranormal? Well, I mean, I think I think probably a lot of your listeners the same thing as you know, as a young kid. I don't know, maybe this didn't happen to you, but as a even as a young kid, I was fascinated by witches and ghosts. And I grew up in a house that was built in the 1860s. And it used to be a a former parsonage or something. And I think it was part of the Underground Railroad. Anyway, we always thought the house was haunted. And all my siblings and I used to think there was this entity in in the attic called Green Eyes. Yeah, I was just always fascinated with stories. Like I'd read, always pick books for book reports that were based on some unexplained event or person or unusual person. Edgar Casey, one of my very first books I bought with my own babysitting money was There is a River by Edgar Casey. I mean, what kind of a person does that? <laughs> so it's just been a lifelong quest. I mean, and even though I've had uh, several secret clearances working for the military, even though I've got a master's in international relations, even though, you know, all these things, this has been always my favorite topic. You mentioned as a producer, there's a left brain, right brain thing. There's a left brain, you know, there's there's the creative side and then there's the buttoned up side yep. and kind of very compartmentalized things. And you said you were kind of an army brat. You moved around. Was your family, were you the only one in your family that was like that? Yeah, I'm just weird. I'm just <laughs> weird. My dad actually ended up having to do a bit of traveling when we stayed put. I mean, I'm, I, I see now as an adult, you know, my mom had to be alone on a number of occasions, kind of almost like a single parent in some cases, if he was stationed further away or whatever. And I remember going to Fort Devens to go grocery shopping at their big PX and, and having that big, huge grocery cart and whatever, all those things that kind of leave an impression on you as a kid. But no, I'm the only one. It, all, my, all my siblings are in medicine and I'm the only weirdo. So really, wow! Yeah. I just yeah, I just there's more of us now. It's kind of if you look around, there's more of us around. I I went into the paranormal like you. I always had a fascination with it, mm-hmm. but I always had tunnel vision. I never had experiences. You know, mm. it wasn't until 
or I never thought I did. And then once stuff started happening, when I made the documentary, some stuff, weird stuff happened to me. Mm. And then I have a, a daughter that's autistic. Mm-hmm. And there was some stuff with her when she was younger and then a little bit older. And even with Little Frog in the documentary, there was a thing mm-hmm. with her where he, when I first met him, he was actually to my ex-wife. He had an interest in uh, children with autism because he felt like they kind of vibrate in a higher level. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to kind of come in and meet her and kind of talk to her and see if he could kind of connect to her. Mm-hmm. He About a week or so later, she had pneumonia or something. She was sick. She was on the couch. And my wife sent him an email and said, hey, do you mind doing a remote healing? He's like, well, you know, she's younger, but I, you know, if, if you give me approval, I'll do it. We got an email back about a couple hours later it went on for you know you, you know brad and you saw him on the documentary it went on mm-hmm. for like four paragraphs he was totally blown away typically when he does these remote healings he goes in mm-hmm. his mind to this rock and then he goes down to this tree where he gets and he goes down below where he gets his, his uh power animal got his shadow he calls it and then he goes and up and he does the, the the cleaning you know the remote healing but when he went to the rock he saw my daughter waiting for him there. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, totally, if you ever seen someone out of contact, you didn't expect to see mm-hmm. them there. You don't recognize them. It totally blew his mind because in, you know, the kind of the well, probably about a thousand journeys he's done, that's never happened. And he's talked to other shamans and it's the same mm-hmm. thing. It just literally blew his mind. And normally I'd be skeptical, but with other things that have happened with my daughter, I'm like, yeah, she's kind of, that stuff happens with her. So that was really kind of interesting with me that that stuff happening and then i once i got involved in it, it became easier for me to get evps and things mm. like that ah! afraid of starting your own podcast buzzsprout makes it easy in fact it's so good they've already helped over 100,000 people launch their own podcast including me buzzsprout has helped me get onto many great platforms including apple podcasts iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and more. You also get a great-looking podcast website, audio players that you can drop onto other websites, detailed analytics to see how you're doing. They're addicting, trust me. Also, tools to promote your episodes, like sound bites, to give your listeners a tease of what each episode is about. Buzzsprout is not only a user-friendly platform, they continually provide useful videos, articles, and tutorials to help you hone your podcast game. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the Afraid of Nothing podcast. Buzzsprout, the best place to launch your podcast. Don't be afraid to start today. So here's a funny thing. Laura and I were talking and we we're talking about, you know, f- earlier about, you know, equipment going, you know, a- awry and things like that. <laughs> and we had a deadline. <laughs> happen with this thing. There you go. So, Laura, I had mentioned that I had tunnel vision with paranormal experiences until I had a, an autistic daughter. And then I mm-hmm. did a documentary and things kind of started happening. What about you? What was your first experience in the paranormal? And have they been pretty steady or sporadic throughout your adult years? Well, this is the funny thing. I think I would pee myself if I actually saw something I couldn't <laughs> that that like I, I will actually tell you just a quick funny story. Uh, it's not terribly funny, but my dad passed away in 2010 and I had come home to visit my sisters for Easter because my mom was on on uh, vacation or something. So I was using the house that my parents lived in and uh, I had a backpack and I put it down in the middle of the dining room floor because I think I was... I can't remember, but I remember placing it in the middle of the floor and saying to myself, because my dad was very orderly, like he was very jovial and outgoing, but he liked things where they belong. And I said, geez, dad would really be mad if he saw, like, if I just left it here, whatever. And I'm like, so I did, but I did. And I went to the kitchen and I uh, was making a snack or something. And I called a friend to make breakfast plans. And all of a sudden, and I'm on the phone with my friend, Brian, and I'm talking away and I turn around and my backpack is in the door of the kitchen. And I, I'm like, uh, Brian, uh, my backpack is, <laughs> and then I'm like, oh my God, it, maybe my dad moved. And like, I was like, dad, I'm not ready to see you, please. I love you. I don't, but I, I think I will absolutely have a coronary if you show up. <laughs> But because I, I thought to myself, wait a minute, did I move it? Did I bring it there and drive? But does not make sense? Because the bedroom I was staying in was on the in the other direction. You know what I mean? Like you walk in and you're in the dining room, and either you go 
to one direction and go to the bedroom that I was going to be staying in, or you go in the other direction and go to the kitchen. I, there was no reason I would bring the backpack because it was nothing I needed. In, I mean, I would need it in the bedroom. So yeah. it wouldn't make sense. So I'm like, my brain is click, 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 click thinking, did I do this? Did I do this? So things like that. And then another time I was going to watch Game of Thrones with my mom uh, when I was visiting her and they had this bed that was covered in like Louis the 14th pillows, you know, yeah. my dad loved beautiful things. So I took the pillows off the bed and I placed them on the floor and I plugged my cell phone into the outlet near the window and I parked my phone on the windowsill. And I went out of the room to get a glass of water. And my mom's in the, uh, she was in the master bedroom, be bathroom before we we're going to watch this uh, Game of Thrones. And I come back and she's still in the bathroom. And now my cell phone is pulled out of the wall and laying on the pillows. And I looked at her and I'm like, did you pull my phone out? And she's like, no, it's your father playing games with you. And yeah. it's so funny because that's not who, what she's like. You know what I mean? She's very, you know, she was the mayor of our town, you know, or whatever. And it's just so, it was just funny because. Was she tongue in cheek when she said that? Or was she, does she now? No, think she that? seemed quite, she, well, because my, my dad used to love to do it. He would, like, if you'd go to a restaurant and meet him for lunch or something, when you got home, you'd find that there were like packets of sugar and stuff in your purse. Like he would do funny <laughs> little, he was a, he was a joke. He was a jokester and, and uh, just loved to play with people. So I think, yeah, and whatever. Anyway, so the, but those are adult things. I mean, those happened in the last five years. And I, I think I've always had one of those weird things where I knew something was going to happen before it did. It's not like I've taken some, I haven't really practiced or I haven't really tried to hone psychic abilities and I don't certainly don't bill myself as one, but my family always checks on with me before they go somewhere or does something. <laughs> like wow. if I say something's going to happen, they take it kind of seriously, which is pretty funny. I've had a couple of weird experiences on shoots. One, we didn't actually know what was happening until we saw the pictures later, which was pretty freaky. We were in these tunnels in, in England, in the um, Draco tunnels, really cold, seven miles of underground tunnels that were built uh, for World War II so that the Nazis wouldn't know that there was a, a factory under this mountain. So we're shooting and we're this one lovely gal had this crazy experience where she, I'm trying to remember, she almost like felt possessed or something. Anyway, she tells her story on camera and then we, we shoot these dramatic recreations and we had she was playing herself in the dramatic recreation and then there's a, a gentleman a guy died in the mines who during world war ii when they were blasting the mines they used too much like dynamite and and the rubble came down and he passed away people a lot of people who have gone into these um tunnels in this you know the last whatever years have seen this man in coveralls like a workman's coveralls you know yeah so she's she tells you know after she told her story now we're recreating it and she's playing herself and then one of the actors is playing her friend and there's another actor playing the ghost right and we i, I won't give away our secrets on how we shoot it so that he's see-through but anyway, he's standing behind them. And then we had a production assistant, lovely young guy, taking pictures, uh, like production stills. The next day, one of the gals from the shoot says, hey, I think uh, you know, young Freddie caught a ghost on camera last night. And we're like, what? And we look at it. And so here's a picture. There's me giving direction, camera guy, Dave, and then the gal, Jolene, her friend, the guy playing her friend, Gary, or whatever, the guy playing the ghost standing behind them in coveralls. And then the next picture, taken immediately after, I've stepped out of the shot. So there's Dave, there's Jolene, there's her friend Gary, and then the I think Rolf or whatever his name was play, standing behind them as the ghost. And now in this second picture, there's a second guy in overalls standing against the wall. Wow. Yeah. And everyone, I mean, John Zappas, I showed it to him at Salem Con or Mass Paracon, and he was like, oh my God, that's a really good one. But the strange thing is that when we were shooting it, Jolene said, he's here. Like she could feel him. Was it an apparition that was solid or was it kind of like fuzzy or could you see through it? When if you look at the picture, if you look at the picture, it's really crazy. It's like you can actually see him. He's translucent, but you can see he's wearing the same overalls that we had the similar overalls, not the exact same thing, but similar overalls to the guy that we had the actor in. But he's wearing a cap, like a newsboy cap, which we didn't have anybody in. So there was absolutely no one else 
in our crew dressed like that. And so there's really no explaining why he's there's this this figure against the leaning against the wall. It's kind of like it's just just so bizarre because because Jolene in the at that time had said she felt th- that guy there listening to her. You had mentioned earlier when you were growing up in your house there was some type of entity with green eyes. Can you can you talk about that? Well, I think that's actually kind of a it's funny. I mean, it's more it's sad or whatever. When we were kids, we used to think that because there was um the attic we had in this house was kind of cool. It had like eaves and stuff, yeah. and it had this long closet that took a like had a took a turn. Like you walked into it, there was like a rod that you could hang clothes in the front part, but then it actually went all the way. It, it took a took a right turn and went all the way to the front of the house. So it was like this long thing well we it, i mean later in later years we found out there was just like some christmas decorations that were making these glowing <laughs> eyes right. but we were also good. afraid yeah so really it's kind of a yeah. but the house made all sorts of creaking noises all the time yeah. we didn't know if it was just like the settling of a, an older house but there was a lot of there was noise oh and our dog we had a dog uh, named jeremy a, a german shepherd that our family's dog and he passed away and then but all of us would hear his chain around his you know like that the they wear tags around their neck you know yeah yeah, yeah we would all yeah. hear it at the same time like it wasn't like one person heard it or whatever it'd be like or you'd see you'd see a shadow his shadow going fr- across the the hallway the door of the hallway or whatever he used to always sit but i didn't have any like it wasn't like i had this one moment where this apparition came to me or talked to me or whatever it just it always fascinated me yet i'm my boyfriend laughs because i always say i am so scared if i saw if i ever saw a ghost in person i think i would really it would blow my mind but i've yeah. had weird i've had <laughs> i've had so many things happen that you can't really explain but nothing to the point where it was like an apparition showed itself to me but my as I said, my boyfriend is kind of open to this stuff too. So he thinks it's kind of fascinating. We, I mean, I, I can't remember which show I was on, but we kept having the bedroom door at my house open and close. And it, you'd hear, and then you'd hear footsteps walk up to the bed and there was nobody there. And then, I mean, I've lived in my apartment for 20 years. And um, for the first time, I kept feeling is like it, something Is this was, a New York one? Is yeah, one yes. My New York York, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, I have like a, like the living room is kind of long. It's like 23 feet long, but I have like a library when you first walk in. And I have a lot of books on many subjects for like Edgar Casey and uh, books about Mary Magdalene, about s- stone circles. Like I have all sorts of like, you know, curious books and stuff over there. But for the first time, I kept, kept seeing a dark shadow sitting in the corner and Jerome saw the same things, but not the same time as me. So finally we were like, this is getting really weird to the point where it was a bit annoying. So I called Mark Arvilla, and I've told this story a few times. He runs the um, Salem Con, and he's yep. also from the Mass Ghost Hunters or whatever. He's he's great, really lovely guy. So I called him because I had had him on um, uh, Hunted USA. You, is he an empath or is he a, is he a medium? No, or? he's a he's a he's a um, an investigator, okay. and he's got okay. equipment and he knows his stuff. And he's a demonologist now, but at the time, I'd, I think he might have just been he might have been learning it, but. I wouldn't think we had a demon here. We just thought we had some sort of like noisy somebody wanting to get our attention. Yep. So he says to me, I'll do a Skype thing for you guys. But tell me, have you bought anything recently? Is there, have you been somewhere or bought something? And I said, oh, I bought this um this new, uh, well, it's not as new to me, but it's an old rocking chair with the face of the North Wind carved into it. Like the Chernunas, the wild man face. Yeah. And if you look at the picture, you'd be like, oh, well, that's probably what it is. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I said, but he goes, uh, I said, I bought it from an antique store. And he said, well, call the antique store and, and ask them um, if they've had any weird things to happen while the store, the chair was there. And I'm like, they're going to think I'm crazy, but okay. <laughs> so I call and they actually were very open. There was in, in Maine and they're like, no, we never had any problem while it was here, but I'll, I'll call the owner who commissioned, you know, put it here on commission. I'm like, okay, great. She said, no, nothing, whatever. Okay. And I said to Mark, well, you know, we've recently helped my boyfriend's ex-wife, um, his his ex, his former father-in-law had passed away and we helped her clean out his house to to sell it or whatever. But I mean, I brought home like a, a, a croise pot and a couple of glasses. It's not like it's some, I didn't bring anything strange or whatever home from, from there. Um, I said, but you know, I've been on a lot of shoots, so you never know what you're going to take home. 
And so he does this, uh, we're sitting, sitting in my living room and he's on Skype and, and he, so he kind of, I guess, says a prayer of some kind of protection. And then he's got the ovulus running and he's like, so what, you know, whoever is here who wants your attention, who is it you're trying to give a message to? They don't mind if you are here, but you know, you're kind of really making a nuisance of yourself. And all of a sudden, clear as day, all of us here, Jerome from the ovulus and we're like uh what because jerome is my boyfriend's name yeah and we're like what and all of a sudden again clear as day it says jerome and we're like okay and so the uh, mark says to the machine or whatever who are you to jerome and it says father or no who is jerome to you and he's it says son it says son and jerome's father passed away a long time ago but they weren't terribly close so uh but mark says well speak french to it and because jerome's from france and he says ask him something only he would know so he does he's asking in french and the machine starts going crazy it's talking a language none of us know or like this is really weird when you know whatever it turns out it was his former father-in-law who he was very close with and it was speaking hebrew wow my God. Yeah. How did you find that? So, you just had a recording of it and you're somebody. Yeah. We, when yeah. we, yeah, we, I mean, we, we, we figured it out while during the session or whatever that it yeah. was, um, but it was pretty wild. Um, so that was kind of cool. And I wasn't sure if I had brought it as an attached to whatever this was going on uh, as an attachment home, because I had been on many shoots that summer to a lot of, lot of haunted locations and people are always you know all these paranormal investigators are like you have the best job ever yeah. i'm so jealous i'm like oh i don't know sometimes it's kind of creepy and we were in um the wildwood sanitarium in salamanca new york and it's an old like i don't know if it was a tb hospital or it was some place where they were trying to solve or cure illnesses it was a tb hospital at one time but before that it was like one of those kind of experimental places that was using like electricity and water to try to shock you out of whatever ailment or weird stuff yeah. and, and it was falling up the place is falling apart at the time when i was there i'm sure they've done more work on it then and i noticed in the kitchen window there was this strange triangular shaped piece of wood like between the panes of glass and i thought well that's a weird piece of wood Anyways, we went upstairs and we were recording this. Uh, we shot this um, reenactment. The owner said that she, her, she and her son had been renovating the third floor where the TB clinic was. And um, the son used to hate being up there. And he would say, he said to his mom, you know, I used to hate being here, but now I kind of like it. And all of a sudden they hear a cracking sound and they turn in the bathroom window shattered and like a hundred pieces like both out and in so it wasn't like a baseball came through the window and it broke or or whatever At, because it, the bathroom was a very large bathroom and i think they had taken out the the tub at the time so there was the only thing in the room i think was the sink and they had boarded up the window with wood because it had just broken and i said do you still have the glass pieces from the window when it broke and she said yeah i think so so we're we lay the pick you know glass pieces out we do the story whatever we're cleaning up the room to, to go back to, I mean, to, to move on to the next thing. And I'm looking at my list. I'm the last person left in the bathroom. Feels kind of creepy in there. And I'm looking at my clipboard and all of a sudden from the closet, somersaults out at me, this triangular piece of wood, like the one I oh. saw in the kitchen. And it, oh. it missed me by like just inches. You know, it wasn't like it just kind of just fell out of the closet and there wasn't yeah. anyone in the closet it really like had some momentum behind it it was weird i was like okay i'm out of here so, i mean as a producer you know you're always tucked someplace away where yep. other people aren't because you're trying to listen you're trying to make sure that you're getting the angles you're watching it on a monitor or whatever and so there was no room for me in this room that they were shooting in so i'm by myself in this like kind of darkened stairwell right outside the door where everybody is shooting inside and I can hear this layered whispering. And it was like, oh, wow. First, I thought, oh, maybe the crew, the rest, I mean, because there's only so many people in that room shooting. There's a lot more crew. There's production assistants and other people in the house. And I thought, oh, maybe they're being polite and trying to like stay out of the way or whatever. And I kind of just kind of walked quietly down this, this part of the staircase and looked around the corner and didn't know nobody there. I was like, oh, that's weird. And it was just like, there was so many different strange things that were happening. I was just so glad when we were out of that place. Travis Tritt, lovely, lovely man. He has a cabin out in the woods and 
So I've got the three cameramen shooting and I'm trying to hide. I'm hiding behind a tree because I don't, of course, want anyone to see me. I'm not part of the story. And it was, I'm looking at the monitor and there's like this kind of orb floating around them. And I didn't know if it was a bug or whatever, but anyway, all of a sudden I feel something pinch my butt really hard. And I thought, well, maybe I'm in the shot. And I turned around, there's absolutely no one there. And I didn't get bit by a, a bug or anything. It was just like, oh, that was interesting. But for me, it's like never anything that you can explain away that, oh, maybe some whatever. But, I, but there's certainly been plenty of other weird things that have happened that you like this, like no way somebody could know something or whatever. And then they do. So I've, I've experienced enough things that are unexplainable that I know that there are things going on that we don't, we can't see, or there's other things going on besides what's in front of you. Yeah. You, you just mentioned like a bunch of stuff. You mentioned the only one that was debunked was a childhood thing about the, with the green eyes, but you mentioned there was an apparition that appeared in a, in a, in a photo. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, these, these noises that you mm -hmm. heard, which could have been EVPs, but actually you heard them live, which is pr pretty rare. Have you felt something physically? We've actually had a lot of experience. It's very, you know, I've actually, yeah, like Jeff Belanger does uh, research for Ghost Adventures. Oh, I love Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great guy. And he's like, in 20 years, only four things have happened, but they've been pretty extreme and they're pretty extreme for me. And he recounts some of those stories. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like he'll say, like, yeah, but four things, but you know, but you think about it, each of those are pretty traumatic, like some of the things that he saw. So I, I think you've got a pretty good library of things that have happened to you. Yeah. I mean, I'm not um, comparing them with anyone. I mean, everyone has their own, you know, their own path to walk, I guess. Uh, and I've always just found it fascinating. I think humans are a lot more involved or whatever than, than they realize. I mean, there's more of our brain. We only use 10% of our brain. Um, I take a course on controlled remote viewing like they use for the, the psychic spies. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing. I took a, I took a weekend course, which was fascinating on um, CRV and I remember the first, um, that's where they have to put like a, a target picture in an envelope and you never see it, yep. but the people who are monitoring you have, and then you go through a protocol of, this is what the military taught or whatever. So it's not like some kind of you just woo woo thing, but so you're doing this protocol that you'll have to take the class if you want to learn it, but anyone can, can learn. And I'm going through and I kept seeing strangely like courtroom drama with like um nicole kidman and emma thompson or something like they'd never been in it before but you know i'm seeing this thing and i said that's like that's like central casting yeah. and you have to if you have errant thoughts you're supposed to write them down on on the paper and then i go back to the protocol and i'm doing the work and then um i see tom hanks bobbing in the water and i said that's like that's castaway and i write that down and i'm back doing my thing turns out the picture was two men casting metal from a helmet so my producer brain saw it as central casting wow. and cast away. It was trying to tell me in language that I understood yeah. what the picture was. Wow. And then for my, I guess my graduation one for the weekend after you've taken all that stuff, they send you out of the room and everybody sees the target picture. You put it in the envelope. I come back in. I'm outside the Eileen Garrett library in Long Island. And uh, Eileen Garrett was one of the famous um, psychics of last century like she was a contemporary with edgar casey and i know her granddaughter is a lovely woman anyway so she's a, a library with all of her yeah. books and all that stuff um so anyway so i come back outside i'm standing outside waiting while they're everyone else is seeing the target and i keep hearing in my head there's nothing like a dame from south pacific now i'm not like a big broadway person so it's not like i ever sing that song you know <laughs> nothing like a dame nothing in the world whatever <laughs> And so I come back, they bring me in and I sit down and the monitor who's, you know, going to be running the session says, is there anything, you know, that you were thinking of or whatever that you need to get out on paper? And I said, yeah, I'm singing nothing like a dame from South Pacific. And everyone starts laughing. And I thought, well, I'm either like a hundred, like really on it a hundred percent or completely off. Like it's either one or the other, but not something in the middle. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, we were going through the protocol and blah, blah, blah. And I'm doing my thing. I saw a feathered headdress and I'm thinking like those women like that, that, that dance in um, Mardi Gras or, you know, those Brazilian dancers with the big feathered headdresses and a, a slung skirt and whatever I see yeah. a fire, you know, I'm going through the protocol. Turns out it was um, two Maasai warriors with feathered headdresses and like loincloths at a fire ceremony, but they ain't nothing like dames. 
Yeah. Yeah. You, were you one of the stars of that class or did, did, did everybody walk out feeling pretty good about themselves after taking it? I, well, I think a number of, I mean, I'm sure some people did. I don't, I, I just remember my experience was so wild and you know, I, you know, I, I, da- I certainly dabble in it here and there and I wish I'd take more time. I, yeah. I really have no excuse because of this, you know, pandemic, I should have been doing a lot more of it, but yeah, every time I do it, I, and and of course, this is the funny. This is another funny story. And t- stop me if I've gone on too long. No, keep keep going. Okay, so I was working on a, an episode of a, a mystery show, kind of another one of those segmented ones, and and this was going to be a story about um, the psychic spies and how they actually, during the Carter administration, uh, found this downed spy plane in the uh, forests of I can't remember which country, Cameroon, some somewhere in the world or whatever. Somebody had asked uh, Jimmy Carter if something strange had happened during, what's the weirdest thing that happened during your administration? And he said, well, you know, the psychic spies found this plane. So they had, everyone was rushing to find this downed plane because it had a lot of information that anybody, our enemies or us, you know, would want. So whoever got to that plane first would get not only the technology of the plane, but also of all the stuff it had been collecting. So they rerouted all these satellites and tried to look for it. The forests were so dense, whatever, no one could find it. So finally, somebody without Carter's knowledge sent Russell Targ and those guys, you know, we need to find this plane. They put some people on it. The psychic spy was able to actually even draw a photo, uh, draw a topography of the area and what it was and whatever. They find this plane. Um, I guess later when, when he, he gets called and they tell him, you know, um, president Carter, we found the plane. It's only been 48 hours. He's like, great work. You know, how'd you do that? Oh, these psychic spies. So the, unfortunately this is after he, I think it was like maybe 20 years later and Clinton's the president. Unfortunately, he blew the secret off of this top secret branch of the government by saying this. (laughs) And so then Clinton had to supposedly disband this arm of the the government. Anyway, so I want to, of course, it's a mystery show. So you want to tell this story. It's kind of cool. I want to make sure we get the right, that we're doing the right information and we're not telling, we're not lying or anything. So through people I knew, I was able to talk to uh, Lynn Buchanan, who actually What's his name? George? No, it's, you know the movie "The Men Who Stare at Goats." Yeah, George Clooney. Yeah, George Clooney. The, the character that George Clooney's based on is actually this guy that I spoke to. So Lynn, he was one of the psychic spies, and so I'm talking to him. I'm on vacation, of course, because as a producer, you know, you never stop working. Yeah. And I was talking to him on the phone because I wanted that was the only time he had available or something. And I'm in this condo in in Daytona, Florida, and the master bedroom had one of those bathrooms that had like a, a mirror with like those big lights as if you were some sort of Hollywood star starlet getting makeup or whatever. Yeah. And I can see the lights in on the vanity glowing orange and then fading to gray and then glowing orange and fading to gray. Now this we've been in this condo for a week and had never done that before. And I said to Lynn, cause I'm on the phone with him. I said, uh, Hey, then something weird is really is happening. The light bulbs are glowing in the bathroom. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. That's probably me. But I mean, that's pretty weird, right? I mean, yeah. that's, <laughs> you, you can't deny it's happening in front of you. So I think humans have a lot more capabilities than we, we even know. Yeah. When you go to a place, is, is there anything that you take as protection or, or, or is there a prayer that you do for cleansing it's, before? Or? It's funny that you ask um, because I didn't the first season. I A number of seasons I've been to haunted places and, and didn't do anything. And I think I brought more stuff home. And so um, strangely, when I'd go to these conventions or whatever, people would just unsolicited come up to me and say, you need to bring you know you need to carry x y or z with you or you need uh, you need to do this or do that and i thought how oh, strange why you know they don't know me so jerome and i went to I think namaste bookstore or something here in the city and we had a friend dd who now owns um the crystal garden in the appalachian i can't remember in the adirondacks anyway she was working there and she picked out an adgerine necklace for me which i wore the whole season shooting, uh, most terrifying, and I didn't have anything bother me this last uh, time go around. So I'm not saying it worked. I'm just saying that uh, you know nothing happened to me. So that's, um, that's, not, that's not cheap. That's kind of expensive. That stuff, right? I mean, I was yeah. I, it's a small I, sliver of it, but I'd wear it yeah. if I didn't wear it around my neck. I wore it in my pocket, and I also always carry. This is so funny. In 
there's a place in Maine that my uh, mom and my sisters and I go every year and they have like this Christmas festival and everything. And there's a monastery up there and they have a gift shop and they had holy water and these little plastic, cute plastic uh, vials that say holy water on them. So I would always carry in my, in my, either my backpack or my back pocket, this vial of holy water. So people would think it was pretty funny, but I'm like, I'm not taking any chances. And I, if you know me, you, I mean, I've got jewelry on from every like tradition. So I've got a ring that I've worn for the last seven years. Um, that's like actually the, the stamp of an imam. It's like the first paragraph of the Quran. Yeah. I have another beautiful ring that's a coral carved um, Ganesha St. Michael. I've always got stuff on of his and, you know, whatever. So I'm like, whatever, whoever is in charge, just stand within 12 feet of me if something bad happens because I'm covered by yeah. all of them. Yeah, I'm going to understand there. You, I had uh, the last episode, part of it was getting an Akashic reading uh, by a guy named Andy Grant. He's an energy healer. Oh, yeah, very cool. First time I did it, right? And one of the, my last questions was, you know, should I keep doing this paranormal stuff? Am I ever going to be in? Because I had, I, I shared with him this kind of, when I did the documentary, it's not in the documentary, but there was this weird thing that happened afterwards where I was laying in bed one night and I literally felt my rib uh, cavity like push out and open and something like leapt out Ew. of me. It was like a reverse punch in the gut. You know, it was really weird. And I was facing, it was, it's that, and I wasn't asleep. I was in bed. I was facing my ex-wife who was asleep at the time. And, you know, I didn't tell her, but her, I, as it happened, her eyes fluttered a little bit weird, but, uh, yeah. And it's one of those moments where you're like, did that? No. Did that happen? And then I thought, <laughs> yeah. my mind's going. I'm like, did my soul just leave me? Oh, my God. What, my, is my, what happened? Is it a dark entity? So I had asked about that. And I asked about, is it dangerous to, you know, I'm, I'm doing podcasts, but eventually I will go back. And, you know, I was at the Conjuring House uh, a couple, couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, that place is creeper, dude. Yeah, yeah. It was during yeah. the day, fortunately, you know. But um, – you know, mm -hmm. and I asked, is there anything that I should, you know, be wary of? And his response was pause. And it was like, yeah, there are, you, you've had bad, you know, dark entities in the past. Now it's just like scar tissue on you now, but they do worry that mm -hmm. you don't, you need to protect yourself if you do that. So I have to like text you about where you got that stuff. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep. Well, I mean, it's, we gotta be, we gotta be careful. Everyone needs to be smart and uh, not, don't push your luck and don't be stupid and think you can control something that you have no idea is, what it is or whatever. So uh, I'm pragmatic in that case. I mean, I, I, I'm a triple Virgo. I'm a, actually, no, I'm a Virgo, Virgo rising Taurus moon. So I'm a triple earth girl. So that sounds like I'm a, you know, woo, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I smart because. I think I got to figure out what's right for me. You found obviously some stuff that's good for you that works. And I think, you know, it's, yeah. I think it's different for everybody. Sometimes it's a prayer. Sometimes it's spritzing with frankincense yeah. or whatever, but yeah, you know, you got to find your own thing that you do. So right now you're working on, you were working on Destination Fear. Great show. It's like three seasons so far, I guess, correct? Two. Uh, I mean, we just, they concluded the, they just finished airing the season, the, the spring season of, it. yes, it, it did very well. And they're super lovely kids. Can't say enough nice things about them. Yeah, they're great. I got to tell you, I watched the Travel Channel, and I don't know why they call it the Travel Channel. It should be the Paranormal Channel. Right, right. I, why do they do that? But it's like I'm seeing tons of, re of reruns. If I ever wanted a job, I want to be on that caught on par Paranormal, caught on tape or whatever. I want to yeah. be one of those those podcasters. That, Bob, I'm afraid mm -hmm. of nothing podcast. And I just react and say something top of mind of something that I just saw. That looks like a UFO. <laughs> that would be a great gig for me, not have to just to comment on something without having to go there. I think that because of the you know, whole COVID thing or whatever, there's going to be more and more of clip shows because you don't have to go and shoot them somewhere. You can actually, you know, they just they find these really great clips and then they have folks just do their little thing like you were talking about and it's commenting on it and they can cut it all together and it's interesting and people will watch it because it everything now in production i mean everything went to a standstill obviously and then of course when you, people are going to start going back on the road you're gonna have to take a lot more precautions and it's just not the same i mean it's not the same anymore so how do you prep as a producer you're at home and you're New York apartment, you can't go out. Do you, are you doing prep? Are you doing work, you know, getting ready for when you go out again? Yeah, you can. Of course. Of course. Everybody's doing everything they can do. I mean, every, whatever shows that are, are starting up. 
I think in a sense, COVID kind of gave people a time for, to kind of, if you were lucky enough to have a place to stay and food to eat and whatever, you had a, a, a time to do some creative projects that you maybe put on the back burner for a long time. Maybe people had some ideas or, or wrote some books or had some ideas for pitches or whatever. Like, hey, you know, this is the time. If I'm not, if I'm going to get paid to sit home and, and, and not infect other people, then I might as well come up with some ideas. So yeah, I've had a couple pitches that I'm shopping around. So fingers crossed. Are they reality type shows or are they dramas or... No, they are in the pa- they are in the paranormal okay. realm. They're like live action. They're not like you know. They're not they're not they're not fiction. They're nonfiction. They're actually based on real events. Not yeah. They're they're based on real events, but there would be some animation involved. Now you've been a, a director and a writer as well as a producer. What do you enjoy the best doing? I love directing. I love being in the field. I love meeting folks. I mean, that's the thing. You know, people want to poo-poo a lot of the stuff uh, when it comes to paranormal, when it comes to UFOs, whatever. You meet some folks who are extremely credible. And I think that's what happened with uh, J. Allen Hynek, the guy who they had, the government had to debunk all the UFO sightings. And yep. he had met so many co- uh, cops and folks who had, there was nothing that they would get out of telling people what they saw if they didn't see it. Air Force pilots, things like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the whole Kenneth Arnold. I did the Kenneth Arnold story. Yeah, that's another thing about being a producer, which is cool, is you learn so much about history, so many little pockets of history, little stories that had ne- that you didn't even know about. So that's the fascinating thing, I think, for me. You never get bored because there's always something. Um, and even all these, I think that paranormal is going to save a lot of history because people are, spe- you know, they're willing to spend the money to go and investigate, and it's paying for the rehab of a lot of these older buildings. So, and then you actually have to learn the history. And when we tell the story as storytellers, we need to know the real history. You don't want to be making up the history. You want to tell the history. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. look at the um, pandemics of the past. I mean, we've done so many shows on the tuberculosis epidemic. And there's so many, there were so many TB hospitals. What a horrible time that was in this country. But now we can actually understand it in a way that we never could before was what that quarantine was like. Yeah. And, you know, I think Jeff Belanger says ghosts are history, or he likes to say that a lot. I know he's mentioned, and I, I agree with that. It's just not, it's just, it's not just a scary thing that goes bump in the night, but there's some history there and there is some great stuff. So kind of makes sense that you like history and you like the paranormal. What is your favorite place that you would, what's your favorite kind of haunted town? I know you're Massachusetts or you've spent some time there. Is it Salem? I adore Salem. I, I do love, I do love Salem. And we love going to Salem Con and well, even and Mass Paracon was great too. Sam did a great job organizing that. Yeah. I think one of my my favorite towns, you mean just one of my favorite haunted towns? Yeah. Eureka, you, you, Eureka, Arkansas. Really? Okay. Um, I've never heard yeah. of it. Really? <laughs> wow. um, where the, uh, the, the Crescent Hotel is. Huh. Okay. In Eureka, Arkansas. That's a really great, that's a creepy, I mean, it's really cute and really creepy at the same time. Uh, that place is super haunted. Oh my God, that's another great story. Um, so I was shooting at the Crescent Hotel. It's a place where back in the 20s or 30s, this total sham doctor, quack, whatever, he was a vaudeville guy and he had a radio show and he was trying to, of course, line his pocket. So he buys this hotel that used to be the Grand Dom of the Ozarks and turns it into a cancer hospital and sends out invitation to people. That I, you know, I can cure your cancer. I have this miracle cure, blah, blah, blah. He has a radio show. All these people start showing up. The town is reborn because of the money pouring in from this um, cancer hospital. And he was doing, you know, he was actually injecting people with like peppermint and watermelon juice some really awful like and people were dying and stuff so there's a lot of death in this in this hotel yeah so i'm staying it was me my associate producer and my cameraman and uh the rather the rest of the folks we got local and so they were going to give us several rooms uh in the place and i'm like don't give me a haunted room just please don't give me a haunted room i just <laughs> I, i'm tired <laughs> i have a lot of work to do so we were looking at the different options we had and so that my ap takes this room on the first floor the cameraman takes one on the second floor. And even though the elevator's broken, there was such a charming room on the top floor that had like a little living room attached to it with like, you know, the ceilings were kind of arched or whatever. Like a really funny, like a room as if you were Shirley Temple in a movie. And like there was, it was, it was a really cute room. Anyway, so I'm in this room. 
I'm like a, my dad said I could go into an empty room and mess it up. So <laughs> I took my backpack and I like basically dumped it all out on the coffee table and I've got all my stuff there and fixing my face in the in the bathroom to go down to meet their people from the hotel that has that were hosting us for dinner. So I keep feeling this weird like I feel like somebody's staring at me and I had this weird feeling like I should not mess up this room. So strangely, I pick, take everything and pack it back up into the backpack. And I say to the room out loud, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I say, okay, let's just make a, make a truce here. I will keep it clean and you won't show up. Okay. So just, <laughs> just leave me alone and just don't show up. So I go down to have dinner and, and they have a restaurant there in the, in the first floor sitting with the PR person. And I said to him, what had just happened? And he said, how did you know to do that? And I said, I don't know. I just had this weird feeling. He goes, because other people have found their bags packed and by the door. Another camera crew, the producer had the same problem, but his, but yeah. So I mean, I think I that, that would have freaked me out. I don't think I slept for like 48 hours straight because that place is so Creepy. And the funny thing is I'm good friends. I mean, I made friends with the folks there. They're so lovely and end up going back there for another show and having to stay in another haunted room. <laughs> it's like, stop putting me in haunted room. Was Were there a lot of haunted rooms there or were they just put you? Oh, yeah. As, okay. oh, yeah. oh yeah. Right. No, no. There's, 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 it's not just like one haunted room. There's plenty of haunted rooms in that place. So that was kind of, kind of a funny story. Two more questions, if you don't mind. So one is, yes, sure. do you watch paranormal shows once you're, when you're not working? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So what is your, are there shows that you like? Yeah, I really enjoy the Holzer files. I think that's a fascinating concept to take the files of a one of the first people to do paranormal investigations. I used to read his books growing up. Yeah, Hans Holzer. Yeah, yeah. I think they could do that with other – I mean, there must be other folks as well. You could kind of base a similar – Edward Casey. Oh, Edgar Casey. Maybe that could be your next pitch, Laura. Yeah. I don't think I haven't already tried. But yeah, no, Edgar Casey's such a fascinating character. But what's great about Holzer Files is they actually have his daughter that they can talk to about what it was like, you know, what she remembers of his cases, although she's not on every episode. And I think Cindy's great. Cindy K's are there. Their psychic's great. Yeah, she is good. Now, let's see if we agree on this. The Dead Files, do you like that at all? I like it. I've watched it a number of times and you get sucked in. And I'm kind of, I guess, in a sense, a cop when it when you're like, oh, you know, you want to find somebody yeah. who's very credible and they want to know, you know, so... I think there's certainly ways to test if people are real psychics yeah. or fake psychics. I mean, it wasn't Houdini was after the the fake psychics. And uh, he actually met with Edgar Casey, And like all other psychics that he had met, he would completely rip them apart. And then he ended up having a uh, meeting Casey. And then he ended up writing a movie script, wow. if you can believe it, called The Man from Across the Threshold or something like that. He was so, I think, taken with the truth of Edgar Casey and that he wasn't a liar. Yeah. So yeah, some pretty cool, pretty cool people out there in our history. And I think there's, there's, there's actually a book called they knew the unknown that has a, it's kind of like an anthology of people who have kind of seen beyond the veil or whatever. I think, I'll, you know, close on one thing. You also do voiceovers. Um, well, if you wake up at two or three in the morning or something, I do. something you might hear it. Like I did a, I was the voice of the voice of a Slim and Six, the Beach Body, Beach Body commercials, uh, infomercials. I'm trying to remember some of the the lines from that. They have shakes and soups and all some whatever I can't remember. Uh, and then I did a radio campaign for South African tourism, and our spa fari. <laughs> anyway. And oh gosh, all sorts of stuff. I've done a lot of bank commercials, and it's so funny. I auditioned for one. Um, it was for the South, the East Texas Bank or something, and um, they said it was pretty good for a yank. So I got, I got it, even though I, had, I was from the North. Although I think I try to, I've hidden my accent pretty well, but uh, they can still hear it. No, you, you're battling two demons. You're battling the Boston, and you're battling the New York, and you've done well. I think you know you've kind of neutralizing that. Yeah, I worked really, really hard. I when I was in graduate school, I had, I mean, I would, uh, my graduate degree is in um, international relations. Uh, I wanted to be a war reporter. Yeah, that it didn't get me too far. But anyway, uh, I had friends from Cyprus. I had friends from West Virginia, and people were making fun of my Boston accent. I thought it must yeah. be really bad. I mean, my accent must be horrendous in order for people to be making fun of me that have 
thick accents themselves. Um, so when I moved to New York in uh, 1993, I made sure to say Central Park <laughs> and Car and stuff like that. But when I go home, my sisters uh, have the accent and uh, my mom, not so much, but my sisters definitely. And it's fun. Um, and you can slip back into it. I always tell people I can recall it on command or if I'm pissed off or yeah. drunk or, <laughs> or angry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went to the college at Indiana University and they picked it up there a lot that I had. And I never realized, I would say idea, you know, with an R, that sort of stuff happened a lot. So and they would pick up on that, you know. It's funny in Indiana; they always think you know someone from Boston because <laughs> that's like they think Massachusetts is not much else. So, is there anything else that you'll be working on soon, or you want to let us know? Well, I'm always looking for great. I'm I'm always looking for great locations that haven't been done to death. So, if people know of um, great haunted locations that they've investigated that they haven't seen that think they should have some national attention, I'm always open to hearing about that. Now, is that more like residential? Because there's a lot of, you know, hidden gem stories in residential, or is it bigger, like a Well, both. It depends upon, you know, every show is different. Like Most Terrifying Places, um, which is not on right now. Um, it's on actually in repeats and stuff, but that's kind of a place where you could do either. Yeah. But I'm always looking for everything. But right now, big, bigger abandoned kind of places are kind of cool. Institutions, because they have great history to them, like places that are an abandoned um, military academy or an abandoned I'm trying to think i mean of course there's always tb hospitals and orphanages and whatever but yeah there's cool cool places that have a great hist like rich history and would it also be places that aren't like buildings could it be like cemeteries or highways or whatever in the woods where you focus more on buildings and places yeah it's hard to do any kind of show no matter which kind of show i'm I'm on in an open place, yeah. you know, because you can't control the yeah. elements and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. It's one thing if it's part of a story, it's another thing if it's trying to be the story, but there's a lot of fantastic places in the world and they're all just waiting for their stories to be told. Cool. And the projects that you're working on right now, is it okay to plug those? We just finished airing Destination Fear, uh, this, this, the season that just ended like last week with Sheboygan Asylum. That was pretty cool. So yeah, I mean, not right right now. It's pretty quiet. I hate to say it's dead out there, but it's pretty it's pretty quiet. Okay, you, you said if someone had a place, would you like them just to contact me or contact you? What's the best thing to do? Well, they can find me on Facebook, or or they could or they could bother you and <laughs> they can ring you up, or they can ring me All up. Right. One or the other. Yeah, but, so you're so you're Laura Marini, M A R I N I. Correct. And you're on Facebook. I am. So, but anyway, it was a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, this is excellent. Not only did I get a perspective of the producer aspect, but you have so many stories. I think even more than you probably even realize. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. And I hope I run into you again soon at another paranormal conference once we can get out. Again. Yes. <laughs> That'd be great. been listening to the afraid of nothing podcast please subscribe and like us on facebook until next time stay scared hey you're still here great then why not listen to another episode visit afraid of nothing podcast.com to peruse all the shows that's afraid of nothing podcast.com and while you're there Click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.